Good morning, Harvest City Church. I cannot believe that we haven't been together now for eight weeks. I honestly long for the day when we can see each other, where we can worship Jesus together, where maybe we can even hang out in the coffee queue. Um, I'll grab a hot chocolate, you can get a cappuccino. Coffee, not a fan. But honestly, I'm going to long for the day when we can celebrate together after lockdown has ended, when we can be the church together in the same space and in the same room. Maybe you're here for the first time. I'd love to welcome you as a visitor, whether you're streaming for the first or the 10th time, but you're not yet a member of Harbour City Church. Welcome to Harbour City Online. And a massive happy Mother's Day to all of our moms out there. We love moms at Harbour City Church. We want to say thank you for absolutely everything that you do for us, whether it be in the home, whether it be teaching our little kids in lockdown at the moment, working while you do that, helping out wherever you can, or just being an ear to listen to and tell everybody that's going to be okay. We also want to say thank you for who you are. Thank you for your love. Thank you for your gentleness, your kindness. Thank you for your consistency. Thank you for being involved in our lives. If you're a little kid today and you've forgotten that it's Mother's Day, why don't you run up to mom and give her the biggest hug in the whole wide world? And if you're a big kid like me, please why don't you schedule a call with your mom, or even better yet, jump onto Zoom, have a cup of tea with her, and just show her some appreciation today. I'd love to invite you, church, as we are dispersed all around the city through this time during lockdown, to join us in praying with one another, united every single week. We are sending our prayer points and emails on a Monday and a Tuesday that look at how we can grow in our prayer lives with God. We can draw closer to Him. We're praying for certain things during the lockdown period. I'd love you to partner with us to earnestly seek God and be united together as a church, even though we disperse all around the city and praying together as Harbour City. Or better yet, why don't you join us on a Zoom that happens on 9 a.m. on a Sunday morning for our Zoom prayer gathering. It's also a great time just to catch up and see some faces that you haven't for a while. But again, just to pray together and be together, which is so good. I'd love to encourage you, church, this morning. Out of Psalm 31, verses 21 to 22, David, and he's writing this, it says, Blessed be the Lord, for he has wondrously shown his steadfast love to me when I was in the besieged city. I had said in my alarm, I am cut off from your sight. But you heard the voice of my pleas for mercy when I cried to you for help. And this is David. He's writing it out of a personal space of praise, reflecting on a time when he was a city under attack, where he felt like he was completely cut off from God and that God couldn't even see him any longer. And he was reminding his soul that actually God is faithful. God is a God who comes through with his promises. God is a God who hears our prayers because he is alive. God is omniscient, meaning that he knows everything. God is omnipresent, meaning that he can be anywhere. And David here is just reminding his soul and himself not to be downcast because God always comes through because he's incredibly faithful. And I'd love to encourage you, church, this morning, as our city is under siege during lockdown, things are not as they used to be. Situations for everybody are so different and some are more serious than others. I know people are going through job losses and income being, being cut. But the reality is that sometimes we can think that God is not with us. God has forsaken us. God is nowhere near. Let's remind ourselves of the old stories, of David's story in this example, of our own testimonies, our own lives, when we have seen God's faithfulness, we have seen God's goodness, when we have seen God love us and hear our cries, because we serve a God who is alive and a God who is good. I'd love to encourage you with that this morning, church. And lastly, I'm also excited that we're about to all sit down together. Even though we've split up all around the city, we're not meeting together in body, but we are in spirit. As we sit down to listen to the word together, we're going to be continuing our series this morning in Home Sweet Home. We've got our own fearless leader, our very own harbour master coming up and preaching this morning. It's Mr. Grant Clark. Take it away, Grantie. Good morning, everyone. Happy Sunday. It's Grant here. And I just want to start by sending big love to Restored Uptown in San Diego and Restored Temecula in the beautiful Temecula Valley and to our local fam here at Harvest City Church in Durban. We love you guys, we miss you guys, and I hope you're all doing really well. At the same time, I'm thrilled that we are partnering together in the gospel as churches for this Home Sweet Home series, and just that we're able to preach through some really relevant and needed topics. I think we are living through just unprecedented times, and we are dealing with new, dealing with new challenges and complexities as individuals and as churches. I'm so grateful that we can be preaching this series and helping us hopefully to follow Jesus and live as disciples uh, in a time of lockdown or shelter in place. And today I'm going to be carrying on the series talking about the topic of joy. Now I can feel some of your exaggerated eye rolls as I say that because I know this doesn't feel like it is a time of joy. 
This feels like a time of uncertainty, maybe of stress or anxiety or fear, maybe a time of the unknown or disappointment. Definitely for many a time of pessimism and cynicism, but maybe not a time of joy. But Galatians 5, the passage we're in at the moment, shows us that we can live with joy, even through periods of great trials by the power of the Holy Spirit. Let me read our passage again to you, even though I hope it's becoming familiar. Galatians 5 is 22 and 23. It says, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things there is no law. Now, I want to remind you again, as Andy said two weeks back, that this is not about the fruits of the Spirit, it's the fruit of the Spirit. And each one of those are different aspects of the work of the Spirit being formed in our lives. But this morning, I want to speak in on joy in a time of trials. And Tim Keller, who is someone I really respect, he defines joy as a delight in God for the sheer beauty and worth of who he is. It is opposite to hopelessness or despair, and its counterfeit is a happiness, excitement, or elation that is based on circumstances, which can be very up if things are good or down if things go bad. Now, the last thing I want to do today as I speak about joy in a time of trials is to give you this empty calorie, high sugar kind of sermon, which is going to get you pumped up for the next couple of hours. And then when that sugar high just goes down, you're going to crash as you start to prepare for the week ahead or deal with the realities of life that you're facing at this moment. Today's message is not intended to be a self-help, inspirational, pep talk kind of sermon to get you all G'd up for what is coming. Instead, I'm hoping that what I give you today can help you, yes, to walk through this pandemic, but also to deal with the trials that will happen throughout the rest of our lives, that we're able to walk with Jesus and follow Jesus and live with uh, joy even in a time of trials. So if you do have a Bible with you, can I ask you to turn to James chapter 1? Otherwise, uh, the scriptures will come up on the screen as I speak. But James 1 verse 2 to 4 has some powerful truth to help us navigate this time. And it says... Consider it a great joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you experience various trials, because you know that the testing of your faith produces endurance, and let endurance have its full effect, so that you may be mature and complete, lacking nothing. Now that's an incredible passage, and I think for those of us who've been walking with Jesus for a while, that might be a little bit familiar to us, and we can hear that and think, great, great text, you know, thanks Grant. But actually, for those of us who are coming to this with fresh eyes, this should be shocking. The the logic of this passage goes so counter to the common sense wisdom or advice we've got about how to deal with trials and problems in our lives. James writes and he starts up and says, consider it a great joy. We're all happy with that. And then he says, whenever you experience various trials. What? Whenever we experience various trials that we should consider it a great joy, that even sounds a little bit sadistic. What what does he mean? Because James says whenever there. Now, I think all of us could accept that sometimes when we deal with great trials in our lives, we, we could handle it with great joy but definitely not all of them. And surely as James wrote this, like he didn't have something like COVID-19 in mind. I'm sure he couldn't even visualize or imagine a global pandemic like the one that we are living through, but, but he did. You know, James is writing to us today as much as he was writing to people 2000 years ago. He's, he's writing to all Christians throughout all time and all circumstances throughout all of history as we face trials. And he's doing this because trials are a normal part of life. Now, I just want to say this. This is important to hear for some of us who've come from churches with some bad and weird teaching. That uh, there is Christian teaching that says that Christians shouldn't face trials or suffering or hardship or sickness in this life. But that is not true. That, That is not what the Bible teaches. And that's not what experience shows us. Sadly, trials are a part of life. And Jesus tells us that if we follow him, we will go through trials and persecutions and suffering and hardship. So here James, who is Jesus's younger brother, writes to us with that in mind. And he writes to us saying, whether you go through a large or a small trial, that we should consider it a great joy whenever we face trials of various or different kinds. Now I'm sure I've lost some of you already, but please stick with me as we go through the logic of this passage. What James is saying to us here, for us to live with joy in a time of trials, is that we need to start by firstly changing the way that we perceive or changing our perspective of trials. 
He starts in verse 2 and he writes, consider it a great joy. Now to consider is to think about something. So he's saying when you face a trial, when you go through hardship, what we need to do is think about it, perceive it or view it in a different way. We need to see the trial we're going through as a gift from God, not as a curse from God. I also want to point out there that James doesn't speak about what we feel. He speaks about what we think. James isn't telling us to change how we feel about trials or to feel that our trials are a gift. He's not trying to change our emotions or feelings here at all. He's not telling us to paste on a smile and soldier on and feel good about these things and that we would change. No, the Bible is not a big fake it till you make it kind of book. That is not what Christianity is all about. No, James is telling us instead to change our perspective, to change how we look at trials if we want to live with joy. Now, this probably makes sense, but James has to tell us this. James has to write this for us to read because this is not the natural way we respond to trials. You know, probably for none of us, uh, as we go through a struggle or hardship or sickness or being retrenched or feeling out of control or dealing with high stress levels or anxiety in our lives, do we receive this as a gift from God? Do we, do we say that actually I have great joy in the midst of this inconvenience or bad thing or hardship or suffering or unfair thing or wrong that I am going through? We might see it as all of those negatives, but we don't see these things as a gift and definitely not something that we should have great joy in the midst of. The ESV translates those words slightly differently. Instead of saying considering it a great joy, the ESV says count it all joy. So I wanted to get into the numbers for the accountants among us. But I don't know if you ever grew up and you would count blocks or toys of yours. I was a big Lego guy or building block guy. And I think I would sometimes take all of my Lego blocks and put them into different piles. I'd sort them all out. So this is saying definitely a lot more about my tap anus than it is about anything else. But I would put these into a yellow group, a blue group, a green group, a red group, whatever it is. And then I'd always end up with a couple of blocks that just didn't fit in anywhere. And I'd have to decide what pile am I going to put them in. It's almost like James is saying to us here, count it all joy. He's saying that as we count the things in our lives, when we get to the trials or hardships, that we should put them in the the group or the pile of good things or gifts to us or things of great joy rather than the pile of hardship or suffering or struggle. Maybe if I can use a more grown up illustration, I'm sure all of us deal with trial balances or bank balances and we've got the negative column and the positive column, the green and the red. James is saying when you deal with trials of various kinds, don't put them in the red, in the negative, in the expenditure. Put them in the green, in the positive, in the the income, in the gifts to your life pile. Now, before I get into the why of that and answer that question for you, I need to say a brief aside about trials here. James isn't saying that that even though we must change our perspective or reconsider how we view trials, the trials are easy. Not at all. Trials are hard. That's why he uses the word trial. He's talking about the difficult, suffering, hardship, struggle that we go through with trials. And he knows that those trials are going to stretch us. They're going to drain us emotionally. They're going to make us ask questions about God and our faith that we haven't had to deal with before. And they might make us feel sad or despondent or worn down. Trials are hard things. I'm sure for many of us, we're feeling that at the moment, you know. I know for me, the first five weeks of our lockdown in Durban were a really good time for me and my family. Now, I know as I say that, that can be misunderstood. I I know many of you are are suffering and struggling at the moment. I know this has been a really, really hard time for some. And I know globally, there's just so much craziness going on. I'm not downplaying that. I think in my own life, uh, my uncle in the UK passed away during this period. He he died of COVID-19. I had never met him, but even just the fact that he died has hit home for me in a huge way because this uncle that I always thought I would meet in the future is now gone and has been taken because of this virus. And I'm sure many of us have our own like struggle stories throughout the midst of this. So I know this is a hard thing and I don't want to downplay that. Please hear me in the right way. But I think the first five weeks of lockdown for Shell and I and our new baby have been a gift. Now, having a new baby in the home, our, our daughter August is now 10 weeks old. It's been special, just being able to work around the house and see her throughout the day and just play a role in changing her and feeding her and just eating with her and Shell has been really, really special for us. But I think um, this last week, I've definitely not felt that. You know, if you know me, I'm a pretty upbeat person. I'm pretty positive. Um, but I think this last week I felt pretty down. I felt pretty drained. And on Tuesday, as Shell and I were sitting and having lunch, she just said, how are you doing at the moment? Because you don't feel yourself. 
And I know that's true for me. You know, I'm feeling tired, I'm feeling fatigued, I'm feeling pretty drained, even though you know, I'm seeing less people, I'm out obviously a lot less than normal. But I think I've got cabin fever. I'm an extrovert, I miss people, and I think uh, it was easy to settle in for the first three weeks of lockdown in Durban and then to deal with another two, but almost as the goalposts keep moving and this uncertainty of when uh, we're gonna be phased out of this, when we're gonna return to normal life or whatever our new normal looks like, uh, just is so uncertain and unsure. It's, it's a bit disheartening. On top of that, I miss being with you guys on Sundays. I miss seeing your faces. I, I miss worshiping with you and praying with you. I miss having a coffee with you guys. I, I miss being able to catch up and check in. I, I definitely love the fact that we're able to do church like this, but sitting in front of a screen, a laptop or a TV and watching a church service is definitely not what I signed up for. And it is definitely not the same. On top of that, we've dealt with the reality that our, our little daughter, our newborn baby, who we want to share with our friends and our family is growing quickly. And our parents haven't been able to see her for six weeks now. Uh, some friends of ours still haven't met her. It's a really sad reality to deal with. And then uh, just on a much smaller note, I miss being able to go to the gym and box. I, I miss being able to sit at a coffee shop and work. Uh, I miss being around people and I'm just hearing so many stories from people of retrenchments, of work uncertainty, of not being paid full salaries or not being paid at all, of family issues, of fears, uncertainty and anxiety. All of this for me personally has been very draining. And I share that with you not as like a woe is me kind of story. I, I share that because all of us have got our own trial story. You know, we, we've got our own version of what walking through this trial or this pandemic has been like. You see, trials are hard. And when James tells us to consider it great joy when we go through various trials, he is not downplaying the seriousness or the difficulty of trials. He's holding that up. But he's saying despite their difficulty, we can have great joy in these times. Now, maybe to clarify that a little bit more, James is not a sadist. He's not a masochist. You know, Christianity is not about the freaky deaky stuff. James is not saying to us that we should celebrate our trials. He's not saying enjoy your trials. And he's not saying to us that actually we can only be happy again once we get through the trial. You know, James isn't saying just, just white knuckle it, just hold on tight. Soon you'll be at the other end of the trial and you'll be able to enjoy your life again. And there will be joy for you and your family or your roommates or the people closest to you. Now he's telling us something else. James is writing and telling us that if we have the right perspective about our trials and if we respond to our trials in the right way, that we can live with great joy in the midst of great difficulty in these trials that we're walking through. And he tells us that if we count or consider them or receive these trials with great joy, because this is the why behind it, because if we do that, these trials have the potential to form us into the people that we want to be. These trials have the potential to make us more and more like Jesus, which for most Christians is the thing that we most desire. Now, Paul the Apostle says something very similar to this in Romans 5, verse 3 to 5. He says, not only that, but we rejoice in our sufferings. And kind of again, you go, what do you mean by that, Paul? Again, you sound a bit sadistic. We rejoice in our sufferings knowing that suffering produces endurance. Now, please take note of that word endurance. It's going to be really important to us in the second half of this message. And endurance produces character and character produces hope in us. Now, we don't rejoice in our suffering because we lack suffering. We don't say, thank you, God, for these trials that you've brought into my life. We, we thank you for them. We enjoy them more, Lord. We want more of these things. No. But we rejoice in what God can do with the trials in our lives because we know that God is a God who works all things together for the good of those who love him and are called according to his purpose. When trials and hardship come, we are able in faith to receive them with great joy because we know that our trials have the power or the potential to produce hope and character in us and to form us into the image of Jesus, which is what we want. You know that we would know him more fully and become more fully like him. That is the potential and power inside of trials, what they can do in our lives. And as hard as this message can be to accept, if we change our perspective about trials and if we find joy in, in them, we can know that there can be a great purpose in these trials despite their difficulty. James carries on in verse 3 and 4. And he says, You know that the testing of your faith produces endurance, and let endurance have its full effect, so that you may be mature and complete, lacking nothing. 
Now these trials, these testings, these hardships are a way, they're not the only way, but they're a way that we can be formed more into the image of Jesus so that we can be made perfect and complete, lacking nothing. Now, some of us during this time have realized how far from that place we are. You know, we've seen sin in our lives, brokenness, evil, wickedness, just we're amazed at what has come out of our hearts and has happened in our homes under the pressure that we're facing at the moment. So because of that, we see that we need some work. We see that we need to change, that we need Jesus in our hearts and we need his grace. But what is also beautiful about this, even though this can be pretty humbling, is that uh, this is a place of great potential for change for all of us. You see, trials are a gift to us because they cause us to see this need and then to respond by leaning into Jesus and inviting him to come into these areas of need in our lives. But before we get to that end point, to, to change, to transformation, to Christ-likeness, we need to let endurance have its full effect in our lives. Endurance becomes very key in this process. Now, your Bible might not say endurance, it might say perseverance instead, but the Greek word there is the word hypermeno. Now, I learned this from someone else, but hyper means super or hyper or intense, right? And meno is a word that means to stand. So Tim Keller, writing about this passage, says that what James means by endurance here is the ability to hyperstand or to superstand, to not lie down or give up in the midst of our trials, but to superstand as we face the trials of life. I just want to say, if this sermon was what I said it wasn't at the beginning, if the sermon was kind of a self-help, empty calorie, high sugar, inspirational pep talk, if that's what it was, this is where the music would start to build in the background. And we get some motivational track just playing to pump you up, like Eye of the Tiger. Da, 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 da. Uh, if you don't know that Rocky song, you're missing out on a good movie. Or maybe we'd have like a good 90s track, Tub Thumping by Chumbawamba. I get knocked down, but I get up again. Just trying to get us G'd up and ready and excited to endure, to persevere, to do it this week. We're going to face these trials. But what would happen again is that we'd be pumped for an hour or two and then the realities of these trials would hit us and we'd be knocked back down. I think some of us went into lockdown with this positive mindset. We were going to do it. Lockdown was going to be great. We were going to conquer however many weeks these were. And we thought, you know what? I'm going to come out of lockdown on the other side, a much better person. We thought for those of us who had extra time that we were going to use it to pray more and to read the Bible more. We do a couple of laps of the Bible, study it, go through commentaries. We're going to really seek God and we're going to be glowing in the dark by the end of lockdown. And then with the extra time, we were going to get a six pack. We're going to learn a new language. We're going to just master the world, really. And now, a couple of weeks into all of this, we're feeling pretty tired and pretty uninspired. You might be feeling faint hearted to use a good biblical phrase. And you've got some guy on the screen this morning telling you to endure, to persevere, to superstand, whatever that means. And it just sounds a bit exhausting to you. That's why that's not what James is saying to us today. That is a very shallow response to joy. And his is far more nuanced and deep. James is saying to us that if before COVID-19 hit, you were praying, or if you were engaged in your church community, If you were loving your neighbor, if you were sharing the gospel, if you were making disciples, if you were caring for the poor before this pandemic hit, well, don't stop. Endure. Persevere. Keep doing this even during this tough time. Don't stop. Don't slow down. Stand your ground and don't be worn down by what is going on around you, even though you might have a reason to. But instead, super stand. Hyper stand. Keep praying even at this time if you don't feel like praying, if you feel tired or if you don't want to speak to God, if you're angry with God, if you've got questions of God in this time. Keep engaging in church community even though it's over the screen and you might have Zoom fatigue and you don't feel like another call. Keep loving your neighbor even if you feel pretty drained yourself and you don't know if you've got anything to give. Keep sharing the gospel because it is good news. Keep making disciples. Keep caring for the poor. Endure, don't stop, superstand. Because when we endure, when we superstand, rather than lie down, give up, throw in the towel, call it a day, it forms something in us and we become mature through endurance and we grow to know and become like Jesus more and more and more. And you know, when we do this, when we endure or when we superstand, We are not just changing our perspective on trials. This is not just about a mindset change. 
when we endure or super stand, we are following in the footsteps and the example of Jesus. Hebrews 12 has become a, quite a key passage for me during this time. And in verse 1 to 3, it says, Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, I just want to say to you this morning, don't forget that many men and women have gone before us. They have faced greater trials that we are facing now. They have given their lives to follow Jesus. And they are part of this cloud of witnesses gathered around us, cheering us on, praying for us, encouraging us so that we would endure and persevere in this time. It says, because of this, let us also lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely and let us run with endurance. It's that same Greek word again, super stand. Let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross. Again, super stand, despising the shame and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured from sinners. Again, endured, super stand. Who endured from sinners such hostility against himself so that you may not grow weary or faint-hearted. In this passage, we're called to endure in the race or in the life or in the trial that is set before us. But the writer of Hebrews knows that if the message is just endure, just stand firm, just persevere, just continue, then we're going to eventually get tired and faint hearted, even if you've got more self-control than anyone else in the room. And I know that for many of you, you've been trying your best, you've been facing your challenges, and you're getting to a point now where you feel pretty empty of joy and tired. So what does the writer of the Hebrews say to us? He says that while we endure this trial to stop ourselves from becoming faint hearted and tired, we need to look to Jesus and consider him, his life and the cross. We're being told to change our focus or to change our perspective again, to look up from the trial that we are in or that is all around us and to look to Jesus and to consider again, we're considering his life. We're considering his endurance. We're considering his death on the cross for us. And as we consider him and look to him, we are drawing on his power to help us to endure our own trial. See, Jesus endured the greatest trial in the history of the world. He went through the greatest physical, emotional, spiritual, existential trial that any person has ever gone through. Keller again writes and says that on the cross, Jesus was hit by the atomic bomb of sin, of suffering, of hardship, and even the wrath of God. In the midst of that suffering, as Jesus struggled, he was lashed 39 times with a whip that just completely disfigured his body. He had a crown of thorns pushed into his head. He had nails driven into his hands and feet. He hung from a cross and slowly suffocated. As well as the fact that at that same time, he had the sins of the world put on his life. The, the holy and perfect Lamb of God was soaked and saturated in the sin and evil and wickedness, the brokenness, the shame, the guilt, the disgusting parts of our world were all poured out on him and he was soaked in it. And on top of that, for the first time in his life, because he took our sin on himself, he experienced separation from his father in heaven so that you and I wouldn't have to experience that again. And Jesus endured all of this. He, he super stood with great joy because he changed his perspective from just what was going on in that moment to look ahead and to realize that God was going to use his trial for our great good to bring salvation for many people. See, on the cross, Jesus could have just given up, but he didn't. He super stood. He endured. He persevered. He went through his trial because of his great love for us and because he knew that God was going to work this for the good of us and for many, many others. And for now, those of us who call ourselves followers of Jesus or Christians, today, his endurance, his trial, what happened on the cross is the greatest joy of our lives and the thing in which we put our hope. So how do we live with great joy in a time of trials? Well, firstly, we change our perspective to see our trials differently. Secondly, we endure our trials by focusing on Jesus when we could so easily be focused on other things. And thirdly, and finally, by coming to Jesus with our questions, with our hurts, with our confusion and with our suffering during this time. James 1 verse 5 says, Now if any of you lacks wisdom, he should ask God who gives generously to all and ungrudgingly and it will be given to him. All of us are currently in uncharted territory. Even though there have been these great pandemics before, this is a, a new day, a, a new world that we're living in. 
And I think as we are trying to work out what to do with our lives and trying to make plans and prepare for the future and think about our businesses and our families, finances, all of these things, it's a very confusing and hard time. I was on a call with a a pastor uh, this last week, gave me some amazing advice. He said, look at church history. Look at how the pastors of the past have dealt with these epidemics so that you can deal with this well. And I went back and I I read a sermon by a pastor named Francis Grimke. He was a pastor in Washington, D.C. in the early 1900s. And in 1918, when the Spanish flu, that, that great pandemic that maybe took 50 to 100 million lives in our world, Uh, He was pastoring at that time. They went through a similar lockdown to we've gone through. And at the end of their month-long lockdown, the first sermon that he preached to his church had five points that I went through. And as a pastor, those points encouraged me. that They they helped me to think about how to deal with our congregation and deal with the moment that we're going through. And it was beautiful and personally encouraging for me. And I'm sure for many of you, as you thought about your businesses, your families, your, your health, your mental, physical, emotional health at this time, you've read really helpful blog posts or listened to podcasts or been in webinars or read articles or whatever it is that have been able to help you process this time. But I think honestly, for many of us at the same time, there is so much content available to us. I'm so sick of getting emails about another webinar or how we can help you or our insurance company saying how much they care about us in this time. You know, there's so much content out there can feel a little bit overwhelming and exhausting and confusing. And I think for so many of us, it's causing anxiety and stress too. But here in verse five of James chapter one, James writes to us and he says that above all of those things, if we lack wisdom, we don't know how to handle the trial that we're in. We should come to God and ask and he will give us the wisdom that we need. Isn't that amazing? Would you come to God in this time to find the wisdom that you need to endure and persevere? Now, God amazingly doesn't just give us wisdom. God is also our comfort. He is our hope. He is our peace. The Holy Spirit is the one who comes alongside us in moments like this. At this time, his word can nourish our souls and the spirit can lead us in the way that we should go. And above all of those things, as we come into God's presence, and I know some of us are withdrawing from God at this time. But as we come into his presence, we will find the things that we need. And in him, we will find an endless source of joy in our time of trials. Let me end with the scripture. Psalm 16 verse 11 says, You make known to me the path of life. In your presence, there is fullness of joy. At your right hand are pleasures forevermore. Now, firstly, Jesus has shown us the way, his way in salvation. No, his way is for all people in all times, in all places. And I want to say, are you living in his way? Are you following him at this time? And if you are not a follower of Jesus this morning, you can respond to him today. You can bring your sin to him and exchange it for his righteousness. You You can be washed clean of shame or sin or guilt. You can be made pure and perfect before God and adopted into the family of God today with a simple prayer. Thirdly, if I can jump down to the third sentence there. It shows us that Jesus points us to eternity and reminds us that this life is not all there is. You see, at the right hand of Jesus, there is pleasure forevermore, even though we will endure and we will go through suffering in this life. But secondly, right in the middle, sandwiched between that amazing truth of the way of God and eternal life to come, is the sentence, in your presence, there is fullness of joy. Remember that initial definition of joy we had at the beginning. Joy is a delight in God for the sheer beauty and worth of who he is. Now, in your presence, there is fullness of joy. Our joy at this time is not based on our circumstances. It's not based on what we're going through. It is found in him. So will you come to him today? Throughout the week, will you come into his presence to draw on his joy, to find fullness of joy, even in a time of great struggling and difficulty? How are you going to respond to this this morning? Two weeks ago, Andy encouraged us to spend time praying both in the morning and in the evening and to kind of reflect on our days and to ask God to empower us and help us to not walk in the ways of the flesh, but to live in the way of the spirit. Last week, Tom encouraged us to meditate on the cross and to draw in the the life of the cross, to fill us with love, to love other people and to love God in this time. Today, I want to encourage you each day and not just once, but throughout the day, to come to God. I do sense today that there are some of us who've withdrawn from God in this time. 
and we're unhappy with God, that we've got questions of God, would you come to God and ask him to help answer your questions and to give you the wisdom that you need? And would you come into God's presence and would you do a joy check? Check in on your levels of joy. Firstly, would you ask God to help you to change your perspective on this trial and your circumstances? Secondly, would you look to Jesus and his example and ask God to empower you to endure? Because I know we can't do that in our own strength. Thirdly, would you bring your stress, your fear, your questions, all of those things that you've got to God rather than deal with them on your own and come into the place of his presence uh, and, and ask him to give you the wisdom that you need. And lastly, would you come into his presence to be filled with joy in a time of trials? Let me pray for us all this morning. Jesus, I think of your endurance on the cross in our place. And I pray even now, Lord, we, we look to you, we consider you, and we pray that you would help us to endure in this time. Lord, as our mindsets have been so negative about these trials, I pray help us to change them even now. Lord, and help us to embrace the good of the moment we're going through and know that you are at work in our lives, making us more like Jesus and helping us to know you more. And I pray finally, Lord, for each of us as we struggle, as we strive, as we work through these trials, that you would fill us with like a supernatural uh, joy that transcends all understanding and help us through even the hardest possible moments of this time to live with joy that is found in you. Amen.